Good morning. Some of you are aware, some of you aren't, that um, Matthew Buckman is Tom and Shannon Buckman's second son. Uh, he passed away this morning, sometime during the night. So he was at hospice, wasn't unexpected, but uh, there were funeral arrangements haven't been made yet, but it, the funeral will be in um, Morganfield, Kentucky. That's where the Buckmans live down there. <clears throat> That's where they're all from. So, And I got a word from Jim Riggs. He was going through some tough times, but his last message was that uh, his heart has settled down. They shocked him again, I think, this, sometime this morning, and he's doing better. So he and Dottie, if you know Jim and Dottie Riggs, they're over at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. So pray for them, pray for Jim that he'll continue to recover. He had open heart surgery on Monday, and so he's gone through some serious times. Thinking of all this, I came across Isaiah 25 this morning. Verse, the whole chapter is so good and deserves being preached on. But uh, verse 8, listen to this. He will swallow up death for all time, and the Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces. He will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It's a great verse there in Isaiah 25 and a great chapter. So let's pray together, and we're getting to God's word. Father, we come before you to rejoice in your goodness Lord, you are a faithful God. We know that you care for your people. Uh, we do pray for Tom and Shannon and the family there as they now uh, trust you and go forward with the death of their second son. They already had one son to pass away, and now the second son. We pray that you'll help them. Help them to see you as the, that loving, faithful, heavenly Father who cares for your people. And we do pray for Jim and Dottie. Thank you for Jim. Thank you for his heart. Loves you. We pray for him as he's recovering from this major surgery that he had this week. And we pray that you'll help his heart to get settled down and do what it's supposed to do. They want to be able to come home in the next week, this week sometime. So we pray that you'll allow that to happen. Thank you, Lord, that you are a faithful God. You're faithful in every way, even in the the the... The days and the nights, the nature, you are faithful to provide us with all that we need. You send rain and you send the sunshine. You, you uh, are faithful to forgive us when we confess our sins. You're faithful not to give us more than we can handle. You're faithful to uh, provide our needs, whatever they may be. And Lord, there may be people here this morning who spe have special needs that we don't know anything about. We pray that they might cry out to you, that they might trust you, that you are a faithful, faithful God. Now, Lord, as we look at your word, open our eyes, open our hearts, our ears, and our hearts especially, that you would be honored, that we would be edified, encouraged, that you would draw any lost soul here to yourself, even this morning. In your name I pray, amen. Take your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 8. We're in verses 14 through 17. I'm not going to read those at the beginning. They're short, and we'll go through each one of those as we go along. A.W. Tozer wrote the book, The Knowledge of the Holy. Many of you have read that book. It's a great little book on the attributes of God. But he wrote the first statement in that book. He said this, What comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Now, as we've been in Romans, we were in Romans chapter 1 many weeks ago. We've made our way through Romans, but we began with God's wrath. God's wrath in Romans 1 is revealed against all ungodliness an unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And in a very real and sobering way, when you think of God, you may think of him as your wrathful judge. 
If you are outside of Christ, that's who God is to you. But for every believer, for every believer, God is no longer a wrathful God or a wrathful judge ready to condemn you for your sin. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He is your loving heavenly father and you are his son or daughter. You're his son or child. In the passage before us, you're going to notice that in every verse, there's four verses, in every verse, we're referred to either as sons or as children. Sons or, he's our father. And we cry, Abba, Father. We'll see about that here in just a minute. But this is how Paul wants us to think of God in Romans 8, verses 14 through 17. This little section is rich, jammed with truth, assuring comfort for every sinner who repents of their sin and turns to Christ. And we, we will see this morning four high privileges for every believer in Jesus Christ. Verse 14, all God's children are led by God's Spirit, all of them. Verse 15, all God's children are given the status of sonship or adoption into God's family. Verse 16, all God's children have the inner assurance of being in God's family. And verse 17, all God's children will inherit God's wealth along with Jesus Christ as well as suffering with him. We are heirs together with Christ. So first of all, let's look at verse 14, the high privilege of being led by God's spirit. Verse 14, for all who are led by the spirit of God are the sons of God. What a statement. We saw last week that the Spirit leads us to mortify or put to death the sinful deeds of the body. We have no obligation to our old lover, the flesh. We need to be violent, quick, and thorough as we mortify the deeds of the flesh. You may remember, whack a mole. As soon as you know one stirring in your life, you need to nail it, deal with it. Confess it. Strike it down. Now, though, we're going to talk about a little bit about how the Spirit leads us, not just negatively to mortify the flesh, but positively to put on godliness, godly living, producing the fruit of the Spirit, the likeness of Christ. This is, we have the put off of mortification. We have the put on of progressive sanctification as we seek to put on the fruit of the Spirit. And you find this fruit of the Spirit throughout the epistles. You see them in Ephesians chapter 4, Colossians chapter 3, especially in Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. There's nine there. But these are the put-ons of, the, of, the, of sanctification. And these are the these are what the Spirit is leading us into, present tense, all of us. So the Spirit's leading involves all the changes, all the spiritual renovating. The Spirit is renovating our hearts, all that comes into your life since you came to Christ. And if you came to Christ, your life has been changing. You are having a New, look, new view of life in general, why we're here. Your heart's desire is to honor the Lord. You want to glorify Him. You want to know more about God, about Christ, the work of redemption, theology, about everything that's in the Bible. You want to know more. You have a hunger for this. And you're convicted more and more of your sin. The Spirit is leading you as all, all who are led by the Spirit. You are growing in discernment. The Spirit is leading you to, 
to discern those red flags go up when you hear false teaching. How do you discern that? By the word of God and the spirit of God. And we're going to be talking about that a little bit more here as we go along. But red flags go up when you hear false teaching. You love God because he first loved you. You have a sincere desire to worship him and to fellowship with God's people. You are being led by the spirit of God. Those are all evidences of being led by the spirit. Now, notice one very important thing, though. It says all who are being led by the spirit are sons of God. One very important fact comes out of this, and that is that not everyone is a son of God. Those led by the Spirit are sons of God, but not everyone. Nancy Pelosi was dead wrong when she said that we're all God's children. There's a spark of divinity in every person on earth. Sadly, many people believe that. Many churches teach that. Liberal churches especially. Everyone's going to heaven. You, know? you hear it all the time. Somebody dies. Oh, they went to a better place even though they never trusted Christ, never confessed Christ. No, Paul tells us who are God's sons in this verse. Those who are being led by the Spirit. Now you as a believer are being led by the Spirit. But you can, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can quench the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4 talks about, let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, that, you may, that they may give grace to those who hear and don't grieve the Holy Spirit. So our mouths, our speech can grieve the Holy Spirit. But count on this. If you are a son or daughter of God through faith in Jesus Christ, you are being led by the Spirit. You are being led to become more and more like Jesus Christ. That's why we need to be careful who we spend our time with, what we watch, what we listen to, who we marry. You want to marry someone who is being led by the Spirit. If you don't, you're being led by the Spirit, and that other person is being led by the flesh. That's a major problem. Don't be unequally yoked. That's why Paul told the widows in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, you know, you're free to get remarried, only make sure it's in the Lord. You want a church where Christ and his word are honored, where the Spirit is leading these people, and we trust that the Spirit is leading this church as a as a body of believers more and more to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Christ. Number two, so you're, what a high privilege to be led by, the, by God's Spirit. Number two, the high privilege of being adopted into God's family, verse 15. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit, and I think the ESV capitalizes S in that word, spirit, and I think it's right. It's, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, and we'll see that here in just a minute in Galatians. But you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. What a rich verse that is. Now, there are two wonderful truths here. Number one, God has not given his children a spirit of cringing, fearful, terrorized fear, the spirit of a slave. You're not under the condemning law of God. You're no longer fearing eternal wrath. You're anticipating an eternity with your loving heavenly father. We were under wrath. We were children of wrath. But when Christ saved us, the Spirit of God came into us, and we're no longer under the... Uh, we didn't receive a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. We reverence God. He's a holy father, but we're not under that. 
Now, the second most wonderful truth here is this. When you came to Christ by faith, you were not only justified, we talked a lot about that in Romans chapter 3, declared righteous, Christ and righteousness imputed to your account. God looks at you as righteous in Christ. He says, you are justified or you are righteous, declared righteous. But not only that, but you were adopted. You were adopted as God's son or daughter. And we look at Galatians 4 here. I want to read this because it fits in. I mean, it's the, it's the perfect cross-reference. But when the fullness of time came, that was 2,000 years ago when Jesus came, first time. When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive a spirit the, the spirit, that we might receive the adoption, I'm, excuse, I'm sorry, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, verse 6, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave but you're a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. And we're going to talk about what that means, the inheritance. But this is huge, that God adopts those who were his enemies. All of us, sinners, enemies, dead. And he adopts us into his family by his sovereign mercy and grace. J.I. Packer, in his book, Knowing God, that should be in every Christian's home, that book, Knowing God, has a chapter toward the end called The Sons of God. You need to read that. You should read that chapter. Packer points out that while justification by faith alone, through Christ alone, by grace alone, justification is the primary and foundational blessing of the gospel. Adoption, which is based on justification, adoption is the highest blessing of the gospel. You see, God justifies you as a judge. I declare you righteous. But the righteous judge who declared you righteous in Christ takes off his judicial robe and embraces you and me and every believer with his loving, gracious, sovereign, eternal arms. This is God Almighty here we're talking about. And says, I receive you as my adopted son or daughter with all the privilege, privileges involved. Welcome into my family. I'm so glad I'm a part of the what? Family of God. We all know that song. We may not agree with Gaither's theology, but we like that song. I'm glad I'm a part of the family of God. I hope you are. We're going we're gonna to enjoy eternity together with our Father. I think it's in Luke where Jesus said, the Father gladly gives you his kingdom. And the, our Father, our heavenly, he was our judge. He's now our Father. He says, enjoy my presence and my fellowship at all times. I will never love you less than I love my son. Because he loves us in his son. Remember, we're united to Christ. I know all about your sins excuse me, and wicked deeds. But I'll never bring them up against you again, ever, says Hebrews. I'll not hold your sins against you. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. What about you? Are you a part of the family of God? Remember the story of the pardoning father? The repentant son declares, 
I'm no more worth, I'm no, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your slaves. And what does the pardoning father say? He's, he receives his son back into full status of sonship with robe, ring, and sandals. Not my slave, not even my subject, but my son. Now, the status of adoption is actually a legal status. In the Greek and Roman world, the word huiathesia, it means to place legally as a son. So a man without an heir could legally give a person that he chooses the full rights and privileges of sonship into his family that the man who, who is adopted doesn't deserve. And he doesn't even belong by nature. So God puts his spirit, the spirit of his son, into every believer which brings the forgiven and redeemed sinner into a father-son relationship. Listen to Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. This is, a whole, this is a whole message in itself, but Ephesians 1, 4, and 5, 4 ends, in love he predestined you to adoption. He predestined you to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. In love, he did that. 1 John 3, 1 says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. There is a difference between sonship and ch being a child. Being a son has stat is a status issue. You, you are privileged to be qualified for all of the inheritance, which we're going to see. Being a child of God has to do with your nature. You've been born again. You've been given that new nature. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 talks about that. So, God is your father. You now come, as Paul says, crying, Abba, Father. Slaves among the Jews were not allowed to use that familiar term, Abba, according to what I read. That word, Abba, Father, Abba, has the idea of Papa, Papa, Daddy, Dad. I got a whole list of them here. Poppy, Pop. Did I say Dad, Dad? <laughs> it doesn't get more family than Abba. Abba, Father. It doesn't get closer in the relationship between you and me and our Heavenly Father who adopted us into his, into his family. And it, it says we cry out, Abba, Father. Cry out. That word cry out. Kradzo. If you do a search in your New Testament, you'll discover that that word kradzo or cried out has intensity behind it. It can even be translated scream. When Peter was sinking in the water, he crodzo, he cried out, Lord, save me. He didn't just go, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. When Jesus was going through Jericho and those two blind men were out there in the boundary at the edges of Jericho, and they heard that the son of David was coming along. They cried out, Kradzo, son of David, save us. The people said, get back, stop it, shh. What did they do? They cried out all the louder, son of David. And Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? We want to see cried out. Jesus cried out, Kradzo, from the cross. So here's the, the idea. You come crying out to your heavenly father in crises, anytime. It's a present tense, crying out. He's wise, and he'll teach you when you need understanding in the scripture. If anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, right? He cares for you, and you can tell him all about it. He's your father, He'll provide for you. You can trust him. 
He's forgiving and you can confess to him and he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. He'll protect you from all evil. Paul said that in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He delivered me from all evil. You can trust him. He's your father. He knows what's best for you. Sometimes he corrects and chastises you. That's part of a loving father. He does that. Sometimes he encourages you. Sometimes he comforts you. He loves you, delights in you. He wants the best for you. Like any good father, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. This is... Now, remember Tozer. Whatever come, The first thought that comes into your mind about God is the most important thing about you. Your entire Christian life should be thought of in terms of adoption, about sonship, that God is my loving, holy, heavenly Father. That's a whole study about the Sermon on the Mount. Just get your concordance or do a search, and how many times does Jesus refer to God as our Father? Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be your name, right? Our Father. That's how we should think about as God's people. That's how he wants us to think about him. This is what motivates us to love him, to obey him. If you have a hard time obeying God, then you're not loving him as much as you should. You love him because he first loved you. My dad wasn't the warmest and tenderest or expressive father but I never doubted his commitment to us, the family. I never heard him argue with my mom. I never heard him threaten to leave, never. I can still remember him standing up for me one day down in the Reading Terminal, the farmer's market where my dad had a business down there, poultry and produce. And this cranky woman, this cranky customer, I was working, I was helping, I was serving. I said, can I help you? And she said, oh, go to blankety blank. My dad heard her and he stepped right up and told her, if anyone is going to blankety blank, it's you. Now, what do you want? Huh? Now that's a father for you right there. He's standing up for you. And that blew me away to hear my dad say that blankety blank thing. <laughs> Nobody used blankety blank in our house. I never heard that word used ever in my house. But when Satan tells us we're going to blankety blank, our Father in heaven steps in and says, No, he's mine. You're the one that's going to blankety blank. All right? Our Heavenly Father is infinitely better than the best earthly father. And if you had a disaster for a father in this world, get to know your Heavenly Father. Some people say, well, you can't have a right idea about God being father if you had a bad father image. That's a lot of baloney and psychology. Psychobabble is what that is. No, you read your Bible and you find out what kind of father God really is. And you love him. Say, I'm thankful that I have a heavenly father. I may not have had a very good human father. Every believer has this spirit of adoption with all the blessings of being in God's family. Now, number three, along with adopt, we're led by the spirit. We've been adopted as God's sons and daughters. Number three, along with adoption, the high privilege of the assurance of being God's children. Verse 16, the Spirit himself testifies or witnesses. I think some of the translations say witnesses. The Spirit himself testifies or witnesses with our spirit that we are children of God. This verse, I just stepped into a theological landmine because this verse is very controversial. One thing it clearly teaches that we can and should have assurance of our salvation. 
The Spirit himself testifies that we are children of God. Now, some churches do not teach that you can be sure you're on your way to heaven, have assurance of salvation. The Roman Catholic Church does not teach that. Their whole view of salvation is different than, than being biblical. They don't believe in justification by faith alone. But there's other churches too. Some churches believe that, well, you can be saved for a while, but then you can lose it. Kevin ripped off my sermon. I couldn't believe you, Kevin. You, did you read this? I bet you got it from some. Did you get it from somebody? I figured you did. Paul says the Spirit of God helps us have assurance in this verse. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are, that's a positive, that's assurance, that we are children of God. Now, good men have differed about what this inner witness of the Spirit is. And there's, I'm sure, differences of opinion right here in our congregation. And if you differ with me, that's just fine. We, we have the same Heavenly Father. Just go study it a little further. <laughs> I'll do the same. To bear witness means to testify in support of, to bear witness, to give supporting evidence. The Spirit's inner witness. Now, what is that? Well, it's, it's not direct revelation. It's not the spirit inside of us talking to us. You never heard, if you heard voices in your head, it was not the Holy Spirit. That's, that's another, you probably been, what'd you have to eat last night? Or drank, what'd you drink? It's not an inner voice. It's not speaking in tongues. It's not some kind of inner sensation. It's not being slain in the spirit. It's tricky and not easy to interpret. The Spirit, if the Spirit, if the Spirit is doing some kind of direct communication, the Spirit would immediately begin doing that to every believer when you came to Christ in your spirit so that no believer would ever doubt their salvation because the Spirit would be in there telling you, you're a child of God, you're a child of God. That's not what it's about. John Bunyan would never have told us about giant despair, beating up Christian and hopeful in Doubting Castle. So we have to be careful here. And I hate to say this, but I even, I think Martin Lloyd-Jones goes off the rails here a little bit in trying to explain this inner witness. He has chapters and chapters devoted to this. Basically gives you whole history of the church. So how does the Spirit himself, and it is emphatic, the Spirit himself, it says, bear, bears witness that we are God's children. From an article in Table Talk, you know what Table Talk is, comes from uh, Ligonier Ministries, uh, R.C. Sproul was, started that. From an article in Table Talk, the author, which I couldn't find the author's name, this is what he wrote, and I think he's right on it here. Quote, the Spirit does not give testimony apart from His Word. The Spirit takes this external Word, objective, outside of us, takes this objective Word and applies it in our hearts when we believe. And I'm going to add that as a believer, you find a sense of joy and of delight in Learning about God that you never had as an unbeliever. You could have cared less as an unbeliever. So what's giving you that joy and delight? It's not constant, but it's there. It's the Spirit of God, I believe. How the, how the Spirit of God does all this in our hearts, I have no idea. It's a mystery. There's a, we, we have a favorite hymn. Puts it like this, and I quote, I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, Revealing Jesus through the word, creating faith in him. That's what the spirit does do. We don't know how he does that. But I know whom I have believed 
and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Amen? We don't understand how it all works. It's a mystery. And here's the thing. You can lose that joyful sense of assurance. And here's where Kevin really got off out of his lane, into my lane. You can lose it. You can get discouraged and darkness can envelop you to the point where you're gone. I don't even know if I'm saved anymore. Doesn't mean you're not saved. And I always think, I, I've never met an unsaved person who doubted their salvation. Have you ever met an unsaved person that, boy, I'm just not sure if I'm saved or not. Well, are you saved? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> unsaved people don't have a problem with this. It's only believers who have a problem with this. But if you get discouraged, that dark night of the soul, and I'm quoting Mr. Roberts, that dark night, although it's right here, so I know he ripped off my notes and was reading them. <laughs> the dark night of the soul. It's a common phrase, right? Common phrase, especially the Puritans. But you can go through that. Trials and storms come into your life and you may feel deserted. Godly men have felt deserted by God. Job, I go forward and he's not there. I go back, where is God? I do, I'm struggling here. But your heavenly father loves you and he's drawing you back to joyful obedience and the assurance of his love and the spirit witnessing with your spirit that you're God's child as you feed and meditate on the wonderful promises of God. That's the spirit working in your heart. You see, the spirit changed your heart. You were going your way. You didn't care about God, really. Now you're going God's way. Well, what made that difference? Did you dredge that out of your own depraved heart? No, you didn't. The spirit of God is working in your heart, drawing you to Christ. All right, finally, the high privilege of being heirs of God, verse 17. And if children, if we're children, we have the spirit of, uh, of adoption. What was the last part of that last verse? Oh, yeah. The Spirit testifies that we are children of God. Okay, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. If you're a part of the family of God, according to verse 17, if you're a part of the family of God, the Spirit of God has brought you to faith in Christ and you know you're a different person, that's the Spirit's witnessing in you, to your spirit. If you're a part of the family of God, then God has a will and your name is on it. Your name is on God's will. You are heirs of God. You are God's heirs. This will will not corrupt you. You know, people inherit a lot of money Guess what it does? And I've heard about these people. It just corrupts them. They go out and they spend money and they get drunk and they take drugs and blah, 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 everything. This inheritance won't corrupt you one iota. Listen to what Peter says about this inheritance. 1 Peter 1, 4. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. You have an inheritance waiting for you. For, uh, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, you heard the gospel, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you believed in the gospel, you believed in Jesus Christ, you were sealed in him by the Holy Spirit of promise, First, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, and verse 14, who is given, the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. The Spirit of God is given as a pledge of our inheritance 
with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Hebrews 1. So here's the thing. Okay, we're heirs of God. We're joint heirs with Christ. That's what the Bible says right there. We're fellow heirs with Christ. What is Christ inheriting? Hebrews 1, 2 tells us, in these last days, God has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. We've been joined to Christ. Therefore, whatever Christ inherits, we inherit. We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. What a privilege. And what is he inheriting? Hebrews 1, 2 says, all things. <laughs> last night I looked out there and saw that beautiful moon. Did you see it last night? Who owns that moon? You know, you look out and you see all those beautiful trees. You see rain coming down. You see the sun coming through the leaves. And who owns all these trees? In fact, who owns this earth? Who owns it? You look at who owns that moon out there? That moon out there. It's about as big as the United States. I did some research. Since it's ours, might as well find out what it's all about. <laughs> it's 238,855 miles away. If you took a car and drove 60 miles an hour, it would take you six months to get there. Daddy, will we ever get there? We're only on month four. Just hang on. We'll stop at McDonald's up here. <laughs> I, Venus. Venus. I listened to Jason Lyle. I love Jason Lyle. He is such a good, brilliant creationist. He told about Venus and how the surface of Venus is so hot it would melt lead. And the clouds around Venus are sulfuric acid. You say, well, we couldn't live there. Absolutely. God didn't design for us to live there. He designed earth for us to live here. And hey, we're going to be here for a thousand years with Jesus Christ. And then it's going to all be redone. And we'll have a new heavens and a new earth. And, but we'll still have the earth. And we're going to live with, and we inherit it. By God's grace. We don't deserve it. We're God's heirs. He created it all for his son. And all those he chose to be in his son. But wait a minute. This sounds pretty prosperity gospel kind of stuff, doesn't it? All this inheritance stuff. This is not the prosperity gospel. If indeed we suffer with him. God's not talking about living in the lap of luxury in this world. Remember Tammy Baker, Jim and Tammy, Tammy Baker? Tammy Baker said, quote, when I tell God what car I want, I even tell him the color. That's not what it's about. It's not about having a 45-room mansion and a gold-plated Bugatti to tool around in. Paul said, through many tribulations will enter the kingdom. 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul said, those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. They may not burn you at the stake, but there's suffering here in this world. They may not send you to a concentration camp. Remember Richard Vermbrand? You probably read that book and saw the movie. Peter alerts us to the reality of suffering. Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, so we can expect sufferings, to the degree you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. So Jesus suffered in this world, right? I mean, it's obvious, and we shouldn't expect anything less. We're thankful for the fact that we don't suffer as much as we could be suffering, but it's a thorny path to glory. Hey, we may see the day when 
Christians in Evansville are arrested as hate criminals because we believe what God says. God's family has sailed through bloody seas in this, in this world that crucified him, but thank God, suffering is not the last word. There's glory to follow. Let me just finish with this couple of verses from 2 Corinthians. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now these are four high privileges of being in God's family. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. We've got some suffering to do, but we've got an eternity in the presence of Christ and in the presence of God more than 10,000 years. When we've been there 10 million years, 10 trillion years, it will never end. Seriously? Yeah, seriously. Think for a moment of those who have no hope beyond the grave, never forgiven through Christ's blood, through Christ's work on the cross, never made a child of God. Think of that. Still blinded by Satan, their own sin. What about you? Will you just be a memory to your family and friends who are there reigning with Christ? That's a... What a thought. Or will you be there too? With your family, saved family, saved friends? Two destinies await every single, Christ, every single person, the eternal lake of fire, condemnation, as Romans 1 talks about, or the glory of God. Which do you want? I know which I want. And I'll tell you, there's only one person that makes a difference. Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ stands in the middle. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul told that Philippian jailer, and you will be saved and all these high privileges are part of your blessing from God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for these simple but great verses here in the very, right in the very middle of Romans. Lord, we praise you for our Savior. We pray that every one of us might rejoice, might understand and think about you as our loving Heavenly Father. And Lord, draw every heart to yourself.